The following is distributed by the Berean Call. Chapter 6 Terrorism's Pagan Islamic Foundation Muhammad, the founder of Islam, was born in Mecca into the Quraysh tribe around A.D. 570. There are no known non-Muslim sources for his biography and only two main Islamic sources— the Life History of Muhammad by Ibn Ishaq, A.D. 768, edited by Ibn Hisham, A.D. 833, and The Expeditions of Muhammad by Al-Waqidi, A.D. 822. The various hadith, the sayings and deeds of Muhammad as recited by his closest companions, also give insights into the life of the Prophet of Islam. The Quraysh of Mecca had a lucrative business as the guardians of the Kaaba, an idol temple filled with some 360 images representing the various tribal deities worshipped by anyone who might be traveling with one of the huge commercial caravans passing through Mecca. Allah, a contraction of al Ilah, literally the chief god, was recognized as the chief of the idols in the Kaaba. It had been the official god of Muhammad's tribe for centuries before he was born. Muhammad began receiving revelations under circumstances so strange and terrifying that he feared he was being deceived by Satan. According to Islamic sources, he thought he had become possessed by a demon and at times acted as though he were. His wife Khadijah consoled him, assuring him that Allah was speaking to him. Ibn Ishaq recorded that when the spirit came another time, Khadijah tested it. She said to the apostle of Allah, O son of my uncle, are you able to tell me about your visitant when he comes to you? He replied that he could, and she asked him to tell her when he came. So when Gabriel came to him as he was wont, the apostle said to Khadijah, This is Gabriel who has just come to me. Get up, O son of my uncle, she said, and sit by my left thigh. The apostle did so, and she said, Can you see him? Yes, he said. She said, Then turn around and sit on my right thigh. He did so, and she said, Can you see him? When he said that he could, she asked him to move and sit on her lap. When he had done this, she again asked if he could see him. And when he said yes, she disclosed her form, that is, removed her clothes, and cast aside her veil. With the apostle sitting in her lap, she said, Can you see him? He replied, No. She said, O son of my uncle, rejoice and be of good heart. By Allah, he is an angel and not a Satan. Muhammad then agreed that his inspiration was from Allah through the angel Gabriel. These revelations, except for those that were lost, and some were, make up the Quran today. Doubts continued to plague Muhammad, however, and he attempted suicide several times over the next few years. After he received the 96th surah, inspiration was suspended for a number of months. Depressed by that, Muhammad again contemplated suicide. His suicidal tendencies, acknowledged by all Islamic authorities, hardly seem to be the mark of a great spiritual leader under divine inspiration. These alleged revelations, there were eventually 114 surahs, presented a revolutionary idea. Allah was not merely the chief God in the Kaaba, but the only God anywhere. Muhammad was Allah's exclusive prophet, and the whole world must be brought into submission to Allah. This new doctrine was naturally opposed by the Meccans. It didn't seem to be a good idea to them to do away with all gods except Allah. It could seriously diminish their lucrative Kaaba business. Faced with growing opposition to his revelations and having only a handful of followers, Muhammad fled Mecca in A.D. 622 in what is known as the Hijra, from which the Muslim calendar dates. A.H. Anyo Hijra in the year of the Hijra is like A.D. Anyo Domini in the year of the Lord. 
he settled in the town of Yathrib, now known as Medina. That became his headquarters until he returned in triumph as the conqueror of Mecca eight years later. After fleeing to Yathrib, and as he gained power and the number of his followers grew, Muhammad's revelations from Allah became increasingly belligerent. Not only must the entire world submit to Allah, Islam means submission, but it must be forced to do so with the sword, under the threat of death, to those who refuse to acknowledge Allah alone and Muhammad as his prophet. Beginning a Religion of Peace Challenged to do miracles like Christ, Muhammad could do none, but he was a clever military strategist. On March 16, 624, as the Prophet of Allah and to the glory of Allah, Muhammad led 300 warriors in a vicious attack near Badr upon a large Meccan caravan laden with riches and protected by a force of 800. Some 40 Meccans were killed and 60 taken prisoner, to a loss of only 14 Muslims. This victory against a superior force was seen as the attesting miracle from Allah that Muhammad needed. From that time, the ranks of Muslims swelled with those eager to share in the plunder Allah promised in this life and in paradise. A timely revelation declared, Whoso fighteth in the way of Allah, be he slain or be he victorious, on him we shall bestow a vast reward. Having proved his military prowess, Muhammad solidified his power through the murder of more than 25 of those who opposed him. The first had been al nadir an old enemy from Mecca. Taken captive in the battle at Badr, he reminded Muhammad that the Quraysh didn't kill captives. Showing no mercy, Muhammad had him beheaded on the spot, setting the example for his followers of what would become the ruthless slaughter of millions. He justified the deed by adding another shocking revelation to the Koran. It is not for any prophet to have captives until he hath made slaughter in the land. Timely revelations came from Allah whenever Muhammad needed them often for his own personal benefit. For example, Muhammad went to visit his adopted son, Zaid. His wife, Zainab, Muhammad's cousin, came to the door to say that Zaid was not there and invited the prophet inside. She was rather scantily clad, and Muhammad was overwhelmed with her beauty and passionately desired her. He declined to enter, but exclaimed aloud to Allah, how you do turn the hearts of men. Zainab later repeated the prophet's words to Zaid, who dutifully offered to divorce his wife so Muhammad could have her. Zainab was thrilled with a chance to be married to the prophet of Allah. At first, Muhammad declined, but he could not quench his passion for her. Sitting next to Aisha, his favorite wife, whom he had married when she was nine years old, an inspiration to be added to the Koran suddenly came upon Muhammad, that Allah required him to marry Zainab, supposedly to show Muslims that it is not a sin to marry one's adopted son's wife, even if she is his cousin. Zaid, of course, was obedient to the revelation. It was not for him or anyone else to question the will of Allah. Thus, Zainab was added to Muhammad's growing number of wives. Many of Muhammad's murder victims were poets who had mocked him in verse. The first was the poetess Asma bint Marwan, silenced by being stabbed to death as she nursed her youngest child. The poet Abu Afaq, reportedly more than 100 years old, was murdered next. Justifying these killings, another revelation added to the Quran explained that all poets were inspired of Satan. As one former Muslim writes, assassinations, murder, cruelty, and torture must all be taken into consideration in any judgment on the moral character of Muhammad. No Freedom of Speech Under Islam 
Far from trying to hide what a normal conscience would recognize as unspeakable evil, Muslims speak openly of such savagery as normal to Islam. The commendable example set by Muhammad himself and worthy of repeating today. At the same time, of course, they claim that Islam is a peaceful religion that sets the highest standard for the protection of human rights. In October 2004, Mahdi Ahmad Hussein, Egyptian Labor Party General Secretary, spoke on Al Jazeera TV in defense of terrorism. He praised both the suicide bombers who target women and children and the beheading of prisoners. In defensive response to what we hope and pray is a growing embarrassment among many Muslims for the numerous barbaric practices committed in the name of Islam, Hussein supported terrorism from Muhammad's example. So how come some voices in the Islamic movement and official clerics tell us that killing prisoners is un-Islamic? No, both the Quran and the Prophet's biography permit the killing of prisoners. This exists in our Islamic law. Why do the government clerics ignore the killing of the prisoners during the time of the Prophet? Some 600 to 700, actually 900 who surrendered and were promised safety, were beheaded. Prisoners were killed in the raid on the Khoreza tribe of Jews. Why do they conceal this? Why do they hide the fact that the prophet gave the order to assassinate some poets? To assassinate. Not in military operations, but rather by individual assassination. Among those assassinated was the Jewish poet Kab bin al-Ashraf. Far from being an embarrassment to Muslims today, Kab's murder is still justified as foundational to Islam. No wonder one author titled his book on Islamic terrorism, Muhammad's Monsters. Painting the account in the best light possible with fictitious details, a popular Muslim website reveals Islam's peculiar definition of peace and justice. Cobb had become a real danger to the state of peace and mutual trust which the Prophet was struggling to achieve in Medina. The prophet was quite exasperated with him. This was all part of the great process which helped to make Islam spread and establish it on foundations of justice and piety. Murder and mayhem equal justice and piety in Islam. There would be no human rights. Those who opposed or even questioned the prophet had to be eliminated. And so it is today. To raise a legitimate question about the Quran or Muhammad in any country where Muslims are in power brings the sentence of death. In the days not too long past, when Pakistan had only one television channel, it always began the day warning viewers that Islam was not to be questioned. Nor would anyone dare to raise a question today. For writing a book in 1988 that Muslim clerics deemed to be an attack upon Islam and its prophet, author Salman Rushdie and all sympathizers were given a death sentence. Rushdie is still in hiding in fear of his life and with a reward on his head. It does not speak well of any religion that must maintain itself by threats and killing, rather than by voluntary belief and willing loyalty in response to the truth. It takes little research to learn that Muslims have their own peculiar meaning of words that enables them to sound peaceful when in fact they are not. For example, to prove that Islam is opposed to terrorism, the following quote attributed to Muhammad in both the Bukhari and Muslim hadiths is used. Quote, By Allah, he is not a true believer from whose mischief his neighbors do not feel secure. End quote. Yet Muhammad's neighbors couldn't feel secure. He might have them murdered at any time, especially if they were poets or Jews. Nor could the neighboring villages or passing caravans feel safe from his attacks, not even during Ramadan, a time of peace for pagans. Muhammad's words sound assuring, but they clearly have a special meaning. 
neighbors could only feel confident of peace if they submitted to Islam and didn't antagonize its dictator prophet. Earliest Roots of Today's Islamic Terrorism The way in which Muhammad established his new religion in Arabia by attacking caravans and villages, putting the defeated to the sword to bring fear and to impose his will on other Arabs, was nothing short of terrorism. There is no other word in today's vocabulary to describe it. In his Pensees, Blaise Pascal made a comparison. Muhammad established a religion by putting his enemies to death. Jesus Christ by commanding his followers to lay down their lives. As another author put it, jihad was accepted from the Quran as the direct word of God, that is, Allah. No one had any difficulty in reconciling religiosity and rapacity. Muhammad had not only made it easy for them to do so, he had made it a virtue by presenting plunder and war as righteous paths to paradise. Terrorism is endemic to Islam because for centuries it had been an integral part of the pagan Arab society into which Muhammad was born and from which Islam sprang. A former professor of Islamic history at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt, built around the Al-Azhar Mosque and the most authoritative center of Islamic doctrine in the world, describes that society in 7th century Arabia. Only the strongest survive. These tribes fought constantly as a way of existence. This mentality was manifested into a basic lifestyle. Plunder the possessions of those you defeat. Invade others to gain position and wealth. When invading an enemy country, they killed all the males and took the women and children as slaves. Islam did not change any of these characteristics or influence the behavior of Arabs. Instead, Islam embraced the Arab mentality and used it to accomplish its agenda. Jihad, that is, fighting the enemy of Allah to death as a core belief of Islam, came to the Arabic mentality not as a new behavior, but as one with which they were very familiar. Muhammad was born into a culture where conquest and bloodshed were the norm and were incorporated into Islam through the concept of jihad. The average Westerner imagines that terrorism is something new that began in the 1990s with the Intifada in Israel and has been getting worse ever since, spreading around the globe. Many believe that it is justified against Israelis because of their alleged mistreatment of Palestinians. But it is viewed as a horrible crime when perpetrated anywhere else. Muslims have practiced terrorism, especially against Jews and even against themselves, for centuries. But with increasing intensity as soon as the United Nations partitioned Palestine in November 1947. In the anti-Jewish riots of December 1947, mobs burned down most of the synagogues in Aleppo, Syria, destroyed 150 Jewish homes, five Jewish schools, 50 shops and offices, an orphanage, and a youth club. Scrolls were destroyed, and a priceless ancient manuscript of the Old Testament was burned while firemen watched passively and police actively helped the attackers. A letter from several Aleppo rabbis dated April 28, 1948, two weeks before Israel declared its independence, delivered to the Magen David congregation in Brooklyn, New York, pleaded, This is the third day we are in hiding. The Arab mobs are raging and threatening our lives. Pray for us. Act on our behalf before your government. Our lives are in total danger. Help us. Justifying Murder in the Quran Does it bother today's Muslims that murder, rape, plunder, and slavery of innocent people was the accepted way of life into which Muhammad led his followers and upon which Islam was founded and still operates?
most Muslims are not aware of Islam's history, and many of those who do know the brutal truth seem to be proud of it. Like all oppressive systems, Islam established itself on the principle that might makes right. And this is the way it maintains itself today, whenever possible, killing all who refuse to submit. Yathrib had been founded by Jews. Muhammad shared his revelations with them and also with the Christians living in the vicinity. When they would neither accept Allah, whom they knew was the chief idol in the Kaaba, as God, nor Muhammad as his prophet, he turned against the Christians and Jews, killing all who refused to become Muslims and were unable to escape. After surrendering to the superior Muslim force in exchange for a pledge of safety, every male Jew of fighting age in Yathrib was nevertheless slaughtered and their bodies buried under the marketplace. Women and children were taken as wives or slaves. The name of the town was changed to Medina, which means City of the Prophet. Here, Muhammad himself was buried, and his tomb remains to this day. Eventually, every Jew in Arabia was either slain or escaped. The law remains today that no Jew may set foot in Saudi Arabia, nor would any Jew dare to enter. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and Senator Joseph Lieberman were the only two exceptions. Any Jew in Saudi Arabia must be killed, a penalty that the Saudis would exact in Riyadh's Chop Chop Square, without any sense of shame before today's world. Beheading is the official penalty decreed by Muhammad, which is still meted out to any Muslim who converts to any other religion. By Muhammad's command, only Islam may be practiced in Saudi Arabia. And so it would be everywhere in the world if Islam could fulfill the worldwide conquest Allah has commanded all Muslims to fight for and complete. When Saudi Arabia asked the Americans to protect them from Saddam Hussein's armies, might makes right again, which had raped Kuwait and intended to conquer the rest of the Gulf states, they stipulated that no Jew could enter Arabia. The Americans replied that Jews were an integral part of their armed forces and would come whether the Saudis liked it or not. Then it was realized that if Iraqi troops captured an American soldier whose dog tags identified him as a Jew, they would literally skin him alive. So a new category was invented, Protestant B. That designation was thereafter stamped on the dog tags of the Jewish military personnel assigned to Muslim areas. That Islam is a violent religion which requires putting to death all Jews to bring about its consummation is of no concern to world leaders. Politics does not pretend to be moral. Today, many PLO agents continue working for the British Secret Service still favoring Muslims at the expense of Israel and covertly playing both sides, Britain was brazenly supplying Saddam Hussein with material and equipment used in the manufacture of munitions a full six weeks after his invasion of Kuwait. Fighting Terrorism in a State of Denial All non-Muslims are viewed as pagans. One is puzzled as to why pagans who have not yet submitted to Islam, the peaceful religion, should be asked to bring peace between warring Muslim countries. We might believe that Islam is a religion of peace, as President Bush and other political and religious leaders in the West insist, if Muslims would stop fighting among themselves and desist from killing us. The Muslim is enjoined by Allah and the Quran to declare to non-Muslims, in effect, this is a religion of peace. And if you refuse to admit that Islam is peace, I'll kill you to prove it. In 1990, in order to allow pagan American troops to enter Saudi Arabia so that they could protect it from the invading Islamic armies of Iraq, Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, top Saudi religious authority, issued this fatwa. 
Even though the Americans are not Muslims, they deserve support because they are here to defend Islam. Defending Islam, the religion of peace, against Muslims who are practicing the religion of peace, seems contradictory. It is no less unbelievable that those whom Islam looks upon as enemies to be killed should defend Islam. American troops surely didn't understand that to be their mission. Yet, their leaders continue to praise this violent religion as peaceful. No world leader expresses an understanding of terrorism and a determination to stamp it out more clearly and more earnestly than President Bush. At the same time, however, he naively or purposely, for the sake of political correctness, persists in calling Islam a religion of peace and carefully avoids mentioning it in the same breath with terrorism. The contradictory omission is glaring, as in the following from his January 29, 2002, State of the Union Address. Our discoveries in Afghanistan showed us the true scope of the task ahead, that the depth of our enemy's hatred is equaled by the madness of the destruction they design. We have found diagrams of American nuclear power plants and public water facilities, detailed instructions for making chemical weapons, surveillance maps of American cities, and thorough descriptions of landmarks in America and throughout the world. What we have found in Afghanistan confirms that our war against terror is only beginning. Thousands of dangerous killers, schooled in the methods of murder, often supported by outlaw regimes, are now spread throughout the world like ticking time bombs, set to go off without warning. Hundreds of terrorists have been arrested, yet tens of thousands are still at large. These enemies view the entire world as a battlefield, and we must pursue them wherever they are. So long as training camps operate, so long as nations harbor terrorists, freedom is at risk. And America and our allies must not and will not allow it. Our nation will continue to be steadfast and patient and persistent in the pursuit of two great objectives. First, we will shut down terrorist camps, disrupt terrorist plans, and bring terrorists to justice. And second, we must prevent the terrorists and regimes who seek chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons from threatening the United States and the world. Our military has put the terror training camps of Afghanistan out of business, yet camps still exist in at least a dozen countries. A terrorist underworld, including groups like Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, jaish i Mohammed, operates in remote jungles and deserts and hides in the centers of large cities. States that sponsor terrorism and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. By seeking weapons of mass destruction, these regimes pose a grave and growing danger. They could provide these arms to terrorists, giving them the means to match their hatred. They could attack our allies or attempt to blackmail the United States. In any of these cases, the price of indifference would be catastrophic. We will work closely with our coalition to deny terrorists and their state sponsors the materials, technology, and expertise to make and deliver weapons of mass destruction. We will develop and deploy effective missile defenses to protect America and our allies from sudden attack. And all nations should know. America will do what is necessary to ensure our nation's security. It hardly makes sense to pursue terrorists, yet at the same time to ignore the very root from which terrorism sprang and which gives it life. Its roots are not hidden, but are there for all to see in a pagan Arab religion known as Islam. Muslims and Pagans Together In A.D. 628, 
AH-6, Muhammad approached Mecca with some of his followers, all recent converts to this new religion of Islam. They longed to join in the Hajj, the annual pilgrimage to the idol-filled Kaaba, where a prominently displayed idol still represented Allah as the chief god among hundreds. Muhammad and his Muslim followers desired to renew the same superstitious rituals they had practiced before becoming Muslims, and which their ancestors had followed for centuries. It would be the first time that Muhammad had attempted to join in the Hajj since he had fled Mecca. The Meccans were still too strong for Muhammad and turned him away. Anxious to make peace, however, with this powerful and violent enemy, they entered into one of the most important agreements in Islamic history. The Treaty of Hudabiyah, a ten-year ceasefire called a Hudna. That document established Islam's law of war and peace and set the precedent for future Islamic policy that remains to this day. No Muslim leader has the authority to go over Muhammad's head to make genuine peace with non-Muslims. Only a hudna can be entered into, and that for no longer than ten years. The purpose following Muhammad's example is not to achieve a sincere end to hostilities, but to deceive the enemy with the promise of peace in order to gain time and advantage to eventually conquer the unsuspecting peace partner. This was always Arafat's intent and, since his death, continues to be the PLO's purpose in the so-called peace process with Israel. This treaty allowed Muhammad and his Muslim followers to join the Hajj the following year on the condition that Muhammad acknowledged that he was not the prophet of Allah. Muhammad swallowed his pride and signed. Thus, in 629, with his fellow Muslims, he entered Mecca and joined with the pagan Arabs in going seven times around the idol-filled Kaaba, kissing the dark stone in one corner and touching another stone in the Yamani corner each time around. The new Muslims, with Muhammad at their head, joined in all of the other traditional pagan rituals, climbing nearby Mount Asafa, then running from there back and forth seven times to the summit of Asmarwa, supposedly commemorating Hagar's search for water. They climbed Mount Arafat, then hurried to Mazdalifa, a place between Mina and Arafat, in time for sunset prayer. The next day, the new Muslims, along with crowds of pagans, proceeded to Wadi Mina, where each threw seven stones at each of the three pillars representing Satan. And so it went. The full details are too long to include here. These ancient pagan rituals were all carried over into Islam and are practiced to this day in the Hajj, which most people, both Muslims and non-Muslims, naively imagine was initiated by Muhammad as part of Islam in obedience to revelations from Allah. Nothing could be further from the truth. What did Muhammad change? In A.D. 630, two years after signing the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, Muhammad's army was strong enough to take over Mecca. This he did, destroying the idols in the Kaaba, including that of Allah, but keeping the latter without its image as the god of Islam. For a time, he allowed the pagans to continue to practice the Hajj, joining with the new Muslims in its traditional pagan rituals. Then he gave the pagans four months to convert to Islam or be killed. Thereafter, only Muslims could approach Mecca and the Kaaba, which remains the rule today. Muhammad's last official public act shortly before his death was to lead 40,000 of his followers in these very same rituals, establishing this centuries-old pagan practice in perpetuity as the most important part of Islam. The Quran claims that the Kaaba was the first sanctuary appointed to mankind, where Abraham stood up to pray and pilgrimage, Hajj, to the house is a duty unto Allah for all mankind, for him who can find a way thither. It also claims that Abraham and Ishmael together built the Kaaba.
In fact, Abraham, Ishmael was no longer with him, having been banished together with his mother, Hagar, lived in Hebron, in Canaan. The idea that he would make the arduous journey across hundreds of miles of Arabian desert to Mecca and to build an idol temple to be used by pagan Arabs is an outrageous fabrication, contrary to common sense, to everything the Bible says about Abraham, and without any history to support it. Family loyalty had long been the rule among the Arabs, who fought rival tribes and plundered passing caravans as a way of life. Muhammad changed tribal loyalty into devotion to Islam. The Quran commanded Muslims to force submission to Allah upon the entire world and required that those who refuse to submit must be killed. The usual fighting and plunder long practiced by Arab tribes was carried on as before, but now in the name of Allah and to spread the new religion that all must embrace or die. No one ever imagined calling Islam a religion of peace until that lie was invented as part of the political correctness of our day. Appropriately, there is a sword on Saudi Arabia's flag. The most sacred mosque for Sunni Muslims is the Grand Mosque in Mecca. Its imam, appointed by the Saudi government, is the closest thing in Islam to the Pope. His sermons call for Jews to be annihilated and urge the overthrow of Western civilization. The homepage of the Islamic Affairs Department of Saudi Arabia's embassy in Washington, D.C., unabashedly declares, The Muslims are required to raise the banner of jihad in order to make the world of Allah supreme in this world. A one-way street to surrender. Such bold declarations that Islam must conquer the world thundered almost daily by Muslim leaders and their denunciations of the West seemed to pass unnoticed as Western leaders continued to praise Islam as a religion of peace and even to welcome into its halls of government outspoken enemies who are determined to destroy us. On March 19, 2004, the United States Institute of Peace, funded by Congress, hosted a panel discussion about reforming Islam. Was Mazamil Siddiqui, past president of the Islamic Society of North America. Yet Siddiqui, at an anti-Israel rally outside the White House on October 28, 2000, had openly threatened the U.S. for its support of Israel. Quote, America has to learn, if you remain on the side of injustice that is in support of Israel, the wrath of Allah will come, end quote. He has called for Sharia law in the United States and has praised suicide bombers, whom he considers to be messengers of justice. Incredibly, Siddiqui has been an invited guest at administration events with President Bush present and was invited to lead in prayer at the National Prayer Breakfast following the September 11, 2001 attacks. How can we be so stupid? For many years, the United States has gone out of its way to make overtures of peace to Muslims. On June 21, 1979, the Congress and Senate made a concurrent resolution recognizing the rich religious, scientific, cultural, and artistic contribution Islam has made to mankind since its founding. U.S. Senate Resolution 43 stated in part, Whereas November 21, 1979 marks the 1400th anniversary of the founding of Islam, by the way, wrong date, Muhammad was only nine years old, and whereas Islam is one of mankind's great religions encompassing every major region of the world, and whereas the word Islam derives from Abraham's willingness to accept all God's commands And, whereas Islam strives for a worldwide community, which does not recognize the superficial differences of race, resolved by the Senate, 
the House of Representatives concurring, that Congress takes note of the contribution of Islam and wishes success to the 14th Centennial Commemoration, and pledges its efforts to achieve better understanding, reductions of tensions, and the pursuit of improved relations with all nations of the world and request that the President forward a copy of this resolution to the Chief of State of each country where Islam has a significant following. By now, the reader has enough information to know how grossly this politically motivated yet fruitless declaration misled Americans and the world at large. The worldwide community that Islam aims to achieve is by force, under threat of terrorism and death. It is true that it does not recognize superficial differences of race, but only among Muslims. It will not tolerate the religions of different races. It is unconscionable to praise Islam for its contributions without also acknowledging its slaughter, enslavement, and oppression of millions. Political correctness is the enemy of truth and justice. What about Ramadan? Like the Hajj, Ramadan was also carried over into Islam almost unchanged from the manner in which idol-worshipping Arab tribes had practiced it for centuries. Ramadan always began for the pagans, as it still does for Muslims, with the first sighting of the new moon in the ninth month of the Muslim lunar calendar. The crescent moon, so prominent on minarets and flags of Muslim countries, harks back to the early Arab pre-Islamic worship of Allah as the moon god. Although Allah has no son, as the Quran declares, this god was traditionally believed to have three daughters, Alat, Manat, and Al-Uzza. The pagans had long agreed not to fight during Ramadan, a time of fasting from sunrise to sunset, yet food consumption actually increases, but to set apart 30 days during the year that were to be free from tribal warfare. After three failed attacks against caravans, another timely revelation added to the Quran gave Muslims permission from Allah to fight during that holy month. This gave the advantage of surprise and brought Muhammad's first successful robbing of a rich caravan near Badr, to which we have earlier referred. From that time, Islam began to grow as others joined to share in the booty Allah promised to those who fought in its cause. Today, Ramadan is celebrated as a holiday that began with the advent of Islam. But this is no more true of Ramadan than of the Hajj. It had been observed by Arab tribes for centuries before Muhammad was born, and it's practiced by Muslims in virtually the same manner today. As the Quran itself says, the month of Ramadan in which was revealed the Quran. Honoring Paganism The celebratory feast at the end of Ramadan is known as Eid al-Fitr, on September 1st, 2001, just 10 days before 19 Muslims, to the glory of Allah, would viciously attack the U.S. in New York and Washington, D.C., the U.S. Postal Service issued a 34-cent Eid stamp at the annual Islamic Society of North America's convention in Des Plaines, Illinois. Such gestures of goodwill and appeasement only encourage Muslims in their determined conquest of the world for Allah. The Eid stamp commemorates the two most important festivals, or Eids, in the Islamic calendar. Eid al-Fitr, the Feast of Ramadan, and Eid al-Adha, the Feast of Sacrifice. The latter is celebrated in memory of Abraham's alleged offering of Ishmael on the altar, rather than Isaac, as the Bible declares. In his speech at the Islamic Center of Washington, D.C. on December 10, 2002, President Bush said, I am pleased to join you today in the celebration of Eid, the culmination of the holy month of Ramadan. Islam traces its origins back to God's call on Abraham and Ramadan commemorates the revelation of God's Word in the Holy Quran to the Prophet Muhammad. How could President Bush, a professing Christian, 
honor Muhammad as a prophet of God and call the Quran God's holy word. The Quran is completely anti-Christian, contradicting the Bible in almost every major point, including denying the deity of Christ, denying His death upon the cross for our sins, denying His resurrection, and declaring that those who believe in the Trinity go to hell. Isn't this quite a stretch for Bush in order to achieve political correctness? To avoid offending Muslims by suppressing the truth is bad enough. To blaspheme the true God by associating Him with paganism is far worse. United States presidents have long honored Ramadan as a holy Islamic month. Hosting a special iftar dinner in the White House for American and foreign political leaders, along with Muslim religious leaders, at the end of Ramadan's 30-day fast, on October 14, 2004, President Bush sent warm greetings to Muslims in the United States and around the world as they begin observance of Ramadan, the holiest season in their faith, commemorating the revelation of the Quran to Muhammad. Likewise, in 1967, the Vatican invited Christians to offer their best wishes to Muslims at the end of the fast of Ramadan, with genuine religious worth. President Bush's speech at the Iftar dinner on November 10, 2004, included the following. As we gather during this holy month, we honor the traditions of a great faith. In recent years, Americans have come to learn more about our Muslim brothers and sisters. We share a belief in God's justice and man's moral responsibility. We share the same hope for a future of peace. We have so much in common and so much to learn from one another. Once again, I wish you a blessed Ramadan. I want to thank you for joining us at the White House for this iftar, and may God bless you all. Did Bush really imagine that his sincere gesture of goodwill would be accepted by Muslims around the world and make them more kindly disposed toward us? Did he hope it might cause Muslims to betray Muhammad, Allah, and the Quran by abandoning the required jihad conquest of mankind? Did he not realize that his embrace of Islam as an acceptable religion of God would only be seen as an act of appeasement and encourage terrorists to believe that no matter what atrocities they committed, Islam would still be praised in the West as a religion of peace? Or was political correctness simply getting out of hand? This is God's Word? Bush surely must know that the Allah of Islam is not the Yahweh of the Bible, nor does Islam have any relationship to God's call on Abraham. That call brought him into the land that the God of Israel promised to his descendants through Isaac and Jacob. Muhammad hated and killed these descendants, whom God calls his chosen people, the apple of his eye. The Bible warns, He that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. It is Islam that causes the Muslims to seek the destruction of Israel and the possession of that land by the descendants of Ishmael. How could Bush seriously honor the Quran's contradiction of infallible biblical teaching? The Quran allegedly inspired by Allah through Gabriel is God's word? In contrast to the thousands of ancient manuscripts we have for the Bible, the Quran was taken down on palm leaves, sticks, stones, bark, bones, and anything available when Muhammad began to recite. Some revelations were recalled by memory with nothing in writing to support them. Muhammad's favorite wife, Aisha, said that more than 100 verses were missing from one chapter alone, having been eaten by domestic animals while in her possession. The four caliphs who immediately succeeded Muhammad are called the rightly guided caliphs. The Quran, which was revealed over a period of 16 years, was not compiled in Muhammad's lifetime, but many years later under Uthman ibn Affan, the third of these four. 
when it was proposed to Abu Bakr, Muhammad's father-in-law and first successor, that he put together an official version of the Quran, he objected because Muhammad had said nothing about doing so. Some who had memorized the Quran during Muhammad's lifetime protested that Uthman's version was not correct. He answered these sincere concerns by having all rival copies destroyed. A number of surahs in the Quran have titles so strange that not even Muslim scholars know what they mean. Taha, Yasin, Sad, Kaf, Nun, etc. Others have meaningless names such as the Ant. That chapter describes a battle between Solomon's army of jinn, spirit beings, possibly good but usually evil, men and birds, and an army of ants. Solomon hears an ant named Tahina speaking three miles away. There is a hoopoe bird that is late showing up because it has been with the queen of Sheba. Solomon sends it back to preach the gospel. And this is a revelation from Allah. Much of the Quran reads like children's Arabian fairy tales. The elephant is about a battle between elephants and vultures. The cow tells of Jews who were transformed into apes for breaking the Sabbath. This is why Muslims often call Jews apes of two angels who seduce people in Babylon with magic and of a Jew murdered by a cousin. God tells Moses to kill a cow and hit the dead man with part of it. The dead man revives, identifies his killer, then dies again. Muhammad, under inspiration from Allah, said that upon awakening one must blow his nose three times to rid himself of the devil, who spends the night in a man's nostrils. This is God's holy word, the foundation of the one true religion. In fact, falling asleep can be very dangerous for a Muslim. Muhammad said that yawning is from Satan. As for Muslims who fall asleep while praying, the Prophet said Satan urinates in their ears. Furthermore, one must be very careful not to turn one eyes upward when praying. Abu Huraira heard the Prophet say people should avoid lifting their eyes towards the sky while supplicating in prayer. Otherwise, their eyes would be snatched away. Moreover, apparently Allah does not accept prayer from those who have bad breath from eating raw onions or garlic. We have the word of the Prophet for that, who said on more than one occasion, whoever has eaten garlic or onion should not come near our mosque. On the positive side, Muhammad had a remedy even for those in hell. Passing by two graves one day, Islam's founding prophet stopped, took a green date palm leaf, split it, and put half on each grave. O oh, Allah's apostle, why have you done so? people asked. Muhammad replied, I hope that their punishment in hell may be lessened until they, that is, the palm leaves, become dry. Women should be especially concerned, however, because Muhammad claimed that he had been given a look into hell, and most of its inhabitants were women. Christians Honor Allah and Islam most Christians are ignorant of what Islam is like, yet many nevertheless commend it without any understanding. Billy Graham has naively said, quote, Islam is misunderstood. Muhammad had a great respect for Jesus, called Jesus the greatest of the prophets except himself. I think we're closer to Islam than we really think we are, end quote. Yes, as close as the distance between hell and heaven— and Muslims would agree. As we have already seen, Islam is thoroughly anti-Christian. Belief in the Trinity sends one to hell. Billy Graham has been a longtime friend and admirer of Robert Schuller. It was Graham who told Schuller in 1969 that he ought to be televising his church services. Graham even suggested that it be called the Hour of Power. Billy was pleased when Schuler told him that more than a million Muslims watch his program each week. 
the great evangelist seemed untroubled that Schuler's hour of power would be so popular with the followers of a totally anti-Christian and anti-Israel religion. On CNN's Larry King Live, Schuler, who was being interviewed from the Middle East, enthusiastically told King he'd had three wonderful visits in the home of the leading Muslim thinker and leader in the world, the Grand Mufti of the Great Mosque in Damascus. The Mufti's invitation to speak in his mosque had brought Schuler over there. Incredibly, Schuler rejoiced, quote, I have seldom met with a man with whom I felt an immediate kinship of spirit and an agreement of faith and philosophy quite like I have with the Grand Mufti of the Faith. End quote. Schuler later welcomed the Imam's son, also an Imam, to his Hour of Power broadcast and was thrilled, as was his audience, when the young man declared that all Muslims believe in Jesus Christ and that all Syrians are Christians. Could any lie be greater? Schuler has sponsored at his Crystal Cathedral in Garden Grove, California, a joint Christian-Muslim Institute for Peace. He told the imam, Alfred Mohammed, that if all of his, that is, Schuler's descendants, became Muslims, it wouldn't bother him as long as they weren't atheists. Could he possibly not realize what he is saying? Two months after 9-11, Schuler, who on Sunday mornings has the largest religious TV show in the world, basked in the acclaim of Muslims at a Villa Park, Illinois mosque. Schuler co-hosted this Evening of Religious Solidarity with Imam W.D. Muhammad. One of the honored guests, pseudo-Muslim Louis Farrakhan, praised Schuler as a mighty spiritual giant, whose Hour of Power television program he had watched with approval for about 30 years. Farrakhan succeeded Elijah Muhammad, who had been the head until his death of Black America's Nation of Islam. In spite of its name, NOI has little relationship to Islam. When Malcolm X, who founded several NOI temples and was second only to Elijah Muhammad, realized the difference, he converted to Orthodox Islam. In April of 1964, he went to Mecca in Saudi Arabia, made his first Hajj, and changed his name to El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. He exposed NOI as far from true Islam and was marked for death. He and his family survived a firebombing of his New York home on February 14, 1965. Then, a week later, as he was just beginning a speech at Manhattan's Audubon Ballroom, he was shot to death by three NOI members. The assassins were arrested and convicted of first-degree murder. Of course, it was rumored that Farrakhan was responsible, but that was never proved. Farrakhan claims to have spent time consulting his predecessor, Elijah Muhammad, in a giant spaceship circling Earth, the precursor of a fleet of UFOs coming to this planet to destroy the white man. That obvious fiction makes no difference to Schuler, who has generously declared that, quote, asking people to change their faith was utterly ridiculous, end quote. Coming to the defense of history's most cruel and violent religion, Schuler insists, again, quote, This is a time to guard against attacking religion. It has been my honor to become acquainted with the power leaders of positive Islam, and there is and has been a strong anti-Islam propaganda loose in this world, end quote. Positive Islam? Muhammad never heard of it. Anti-Islam propaganda? No one could give Islam a worse name than Muhammad, the Koran, and centuries of slaughter have done from the beginning. And that is not propaganda. An Anti-Christian Religion in contrast, Jerry Falwell, who has publicly spoken out in support of Israel many times, declared on 60 Minutes that Muhammad was a terrorist. And as Franklin Graham has also said, Islam is evil and wicked. 
For those remarks, Christianity Today rebuked them, saying that Islam would not have become the second largest world religion if it were as thoroughly evil as these comments suggest. So evil can't grow and prosper as Islam has done with a sword? Jesus said something about the broad way, and Solomon about a way that seemeth right unto a man, both of which lead to destruction. In an article titled, Allah Does Not Belong to Islam, Hank Hanegraaff's Christian Research Journal declared, quote, Allah is the God Arab-speaking Christians worship. The Arabic Bible is replete with the word Allah, beginning with Genesis and ending with Revelation. Jesus Christ is even called the Son of Allah in the Arabic Scriptures. Allah is simply the word or term for God in another language, Arabic, equivalent to English God or French Dieu or Spanish Dios. We can join our Arab brothers and sisters in Christ who often say, Allah be praised. Some Christian leaders, in their eagerness to placate Muslims, mouth the most outrageous nonsense under the umbrella of scholarship. In fact, Allah is not a generic term, but the name, as we have seen, of a particular pagan deity, the chief of the idols in the ancient Kaaba. The generic word for God is Elah, found throughout the Quran as in, Allah, there is no Elah save Him. Allah is only one Elah. La ilaha i Allah, Muhammadan Razulu Allah declares that there is no Elah but Allah. Of Allah, the Quran says, So believe in Allah, and say not three. Cease. Allah is only one God. Far is it removed from His transcendent majesty that He should have a son. Then how can the Arabic Bible call Jesus the Son of Allah? That Allah has a son is denied sixteen times in the Quran. How blasphemous, then, to use Allah for God in the Arabic Bible. What could, for Allah so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, possibly mean? Furthermore, Allah has none of the characteristics of Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Allah is unknowable, whereas the God of the Bible reveals Himself to His own. Christ even stated that life eternal is only for those who know Him and the Father. Allah changes His mind and His revelations, whereas the God of the Bible never changes, nor does His Word. Allah requires that Muslims die for Him, but the God of the Bible came to this earth through a virgin birth and died for us, paying the full penalty for our sins on the cross. Allah has no just basis for forgiveness of man's sins, but the God of the Bible does. He forgives sins righteously, because the full penalty for all mankind's sins was paid by Christ. Of course, this grievous heresy that Allah and Yahweh are one and the same has been promoted for years by the Roman Catholic Church. The Second Vatican Council declared, quote, But the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator, in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. Together with us, they adore the one merciful God. In 1969, at the Muslim University of Al-Azhar, Cairo, Cardinal Koenig proclaimed that Muslims and Christians believe in the same God. On April 24, 1974, Cardinal Pignadoli, president of the Vatican Office of Non-Christian Affairs, paid an official visit to Saudi Arabia, conveying to His Majesty King Faisal as supreme head of the Islamic world the regards of His Holiness Pope Paul VI, moved by a profound belief in the unification of Islamic and Christian worlds in the worship of a single God. It is a blasphemous insult to the God of the Bible to equate Him with the pagan deity Allah. 
Yet this is typical of the willingness of professing Christians to trample on truth in their eagerness to placate Muslims. Such fawning flattery will not appease Islam, but only encourage its terrorism and violent conquest. Nor will such compromising confusion help Muslims to know the true God, whom one must know in order to be saved. The Quran itself acknowledges that the God of Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac is the one true God. Surah 2, 133. Abraham's God was Yahweh, called the God of Israel, 203 times. Surely he taught Ishmael, as he taught Isaac, to believe in Yahweh and circumcised him into that faith. Genesis 17, verses 9 through 10 and 23 through 27. Whether he followed it or not. We have already known that Yahweh, the God of the Bible, is not Allah. The Quran also tells Muslims to believe that which was revealed unto Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes of Israel and to Moses and Jesus. Surah 2, 136. We have no record of anything being revealed to Ishmael, but the entire Bible is about what was revealed to the others. And it does not agree with the Quran, nor accept Allah, but only Yahweh as the one true God. In a March 12, 2006 interview in New Orleans, Franklin Graham was asked whether he had changed his mind about Islam. He declared that he had not. Admitting that Muslims wanted to indoctrinate him, he declared, I know about Islam. I don't need an education from Islam. He reiterated his earlier stand that the God of Islam is not the God of the Christian faith. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to the BereanCall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is TheBereanCall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24-7. Don't go with me, I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back.